What's up, everybody? It's about that time for another edition of the Crew Radio Show. I'm Kevin Swan, co-host of the show, and the crew are professional people who are also friends that come together to talk about the things you want us to talk about. We talk about it all, and we don't hold back. So come on and join us for another edition of the Crew Radio Show. What's up, everybody? <laughs> Welcome to the Crew. This is WHOV 88.1. It's our podcast, social media, a ton. Uh, yes. <laughs> 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 Stuff we talk about off air. Off man. air, yes. But look, man, we got a new format. We, we got do. a new showtime on the radio. Got a new look. Look at where we are. You yeah. know what I'm saying? It's and so professional. It is. Yeah. And it's so good that Jay, who's our producer, we had to bring him from behind the camera. You know, the last, screen time. last few shows, we just hear your voice, man. Like you, like you guys. I mean, like, or or Darth Vader. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I just want to go on record. I want to go on record to say this has been the kindest, the most gentle um, way that Dr. Swan has handled me mm. in the 20 plus years of friendship. Mm. I may even be in therapy because of some oh, things no. he oh, said no. to me. I'm, I agree. You can't come on front of the camera lie like you do. I'm, I'm a co-sign. Uh, that. Am I lying? Am huh? I lying? I'm a you co-sign. Tell me. That. I, I think I, I'm telling the truth. I co signed that. You don't co sign that. I, you know I'm going to co sign that. Come co- on. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's a problem. That's a problem. See, you know what? Now that I've been kindly and gentle, Ooh. y'all been coming for me. Ooh. But, Ooh. That's, but that's all right. It's fine. Yeah. Because I can take it. Yeah. Okay. And I'm coming back all at right. some point. Just know. Okay. All, all right. right. Just, just, you know. Be also ready. That's right. Uh uh-uh, uh. Uh uh. But, but listen, we, <laughs> real talk, we want to give a shout out to the ladies. They're still a part of the show. Yes. Alvy and Sia, they're dealing with some personal challenges. So, we want to send a prayer up for them, mm-hmm. but we're here today. So if the fellas are here, then that uh, means we're in the barbershop. 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 That we, mean, get a, we get a lot of compliments on the barbershops. People are like really like the barbershop yeah, because do. they say it's real talk. It is real talk. And yeah. that's what you do in the barbershop. You talk yeah. a whole lot of stuff. About a whole lot of stuff. So look, Ty, Jay, you know, listen, uh, this is October, right? And we know the election is, is around the corner. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we, we got to have some real talk. We know we take pride in our show. Yes, we have fun, but we like to educate people. Correct. On, on the issues. And, and, one, and empower. And empower. Yes. Go do something. Go do something. Right? So one of the things, you know, we talked early in the season about Project 2025, and you know, that's mm-hmm. cool. But we want to talk about our people on this show. Okay. The Black okay. Agenda. The Black Agenda. The Black Agenda. What? And I know that, uh, you know, a lot of people are looking at it from this perspective. You know, what or who is the best candidate for our people? Right, and yeah. there's some divide in that too, man. There's some serious divide. Let me say this: Let, Can we just just quash the rumor or the myth that the barbershop does not talk about politics? Because we talk about everything in a regular barbershop. You do. You know, brothers talk about everything, and so we we talk about politics too. And there's a whole lot of half truths and lies, but we talk about <laughs> half truths, <laughs> lies, myths, yeast in the story, yeast in the. You story. know what happened at the barbershop? Yeah, shop. bro. You ain't never seen Martin Luther King. Come on, never ever. <laughs> Martin Luther King. Martha Luther the King. Yes. So look, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about the black agenda. And so this is not us. This this actually is something that the NAACP came out with. Yes. Uh in, in reference to what should blacks be supporting or rallying around. Okay. What should we look for in a candidate that would support our causes, right? And you know, uh, other ethnic groups do the same thing. So, you know, here here it is. So there are seven areas that the NAACP came out with, a black policy agenda. We may not get through all seven, but right. you know, I just want to kind of touch on some of them and you tell me how you feel about these seven. Should they be included? Is it of, of utmost importance or should other things be considered? The first okay. one is voting rights. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Voting rights. Oh yeah. It's a big uh, deal. Ensuring equal access to free and fair elections mm-hmm. through the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, which you know we know that that act still is in process. It hasn't been you know signed, nope. all that kind of stuff. Still nope. been stalled. Even when we had control, well, I shouldn't say we because I can't assume all black people are Democrats. But even when the Democrats who proposed the bill had control of both the House and the Senate and the presidency, we still couldn't get it signed because there were one or two individuals in the Senate who would not sign off on it. Yeah, so that's a serious issue. And that goes against the Civil Rights Act and stuff that was passed in the 60s, and now that stuff is expired, right? Well, the 1965 Voting Rights Act has been gutted because of Supreme Court decisions in the 90s and even recently in the uh, 2020, uh, 2020s. So because of that, it doesn't have the same political 
teeth to enforce. See, in the 1965 Voting Rights Act, you had the ability to look at the voting landscape that a state would draw. And if they had a history of voting rights violations, the Department of Justice had the legal authority to quash it or void that particular um, scheme, that voting scheme. But now, because of decisions in, in the 90s by the Supreme Court, they don't have that, that ability anymore. So states can now come up with a variety of laws, and unless you go to the courts and be able to prove that it was based on some type of discriminatory manner, that law is in effect. Mm. That's scary, Jay. Yeah. And, you know, listen, man, because, you know, states that, you know, certain states are Republican-led, certain yes. states are Democratic-led. Yes. And most states kind of enforce laws to favor the party that mm -hmm. the state typically is is you know the party's in control of man. absolutely so now you're gonna have varying laws in different places and and of course all this impacts black people man yeah and, and we struggle with that because we're not educated on the things we can do the things we can't do the rights that we have the rights that we don't have and like you said if the government's leaning more towards one side than the other the minority in most cases in african americans we're the one that's left holding the bag we because we don't know and, and what's frustrating is it's right at our fingertips to know, you know, pick up a book, read it, um, look at it, see what's going on in the news, all that kind of stuff. And we, we just struggle with it. Struggle. And the reality is when we show up in elections, usually our candidate wins. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. We don't show if up. If we show up. Right. But that's the problem. Right. So we showed up for Obama twice. Yes. He won. Yes. When we don't show up. We didn't show up for Hillary. We did not. We did not. <laughs> we did. Let's just let's just keep it real. So, we didn't show up for Hillary, and and a particular demographic within our community really did not show up for Hillary. Correct. Black men. And we halfway showed up for Biden. We halfway showed up for Biden. And so he won. He won. So so my my question to you is, even if this act was passed, because there's so much apathy sometimes in our community, right? There's so many people who don't see the value in voting, don't don't see where it's going to make a difference. Even if the John Lewis bill was passed, mm -hmm. that doesn't, to me, address our issue of apathy, man. Mm -hmm. Do you think that would get more people excited? To, I, don't, I mean, I don't know. I don't think so, to be honest with you. I don't think it would, but what I think it would do is it would limit the restrictions for those who do choose to vote. It would limit the restrictions put, uh, put on assets. Like, for instance, Georgia had a law that um, if you wait in line, nobody could give you food or water while you wait in line. But in the, the more densely urban communities, like in Atlanta, you had lines where people were waiting for hours and hours and hours to cast their vote. So clearly people are going to be hungry. People are going to want to use the bathroom. People are going to need some water because if it's in the summertime, it's a primary. Uh, people are going to be dehydrated. If it's the wintertime, people might be hungry. So it's a variety of stuff. But you, it was illegal for someone to give that person any type of food or snacks or whatever. Now, here's the problem. Georgia was one of those states that historically had discriminatory practices when it came to voting. So with that law, if the teeth, the political teeth was still intact in the Voting Rights Act of 1965, that law would automatically have been considered void until Georgia could prove that it was not discriminatory in effect. Well, maybe the real question, Tom, Jay, is if we're supposed to be the most advanced country in the world, why does it take hours to vote? Come on, you know the reason. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know saying? Like, like, why are people in lines for so long? You know the reason. Because they're not going to be the same level of resources that you have in your upper classes. Like, for instance, I ain't going to lie. When it's time for me to vote, if I spend more than 10 minutes in line, it's a problem. If that's, I spend that's the more, point. if I spend more than five minutes in my area in line, it's a problem. So again, why is it taking so long in certain communities to vote and and not others? Because sometimes you have machines that are limited as far as numbers. You already know that that particular community has a certain number of registered voters. So you think you would think they would have a, a number of machines to be able to meet the needs of the demand. 
However, if you give the same number of machines in an Atlanta that you would give in a Norfolk, well, Atlanta got millions of people. Norfolk may have hundreds of thousands, but the need is different. But is the disparity the same in a city? Not not in a locale like Atlanta to Newport. What about in the same city? Shouldn't there be equal machines to do the same thing no matter where the precinct is? No, because you got certain, like, the suburbs. It's the same city, but, like, you got those metropolitan areas where they got the suburbs. So in the suburbs, the, the population is not as dense as, like, within the actual city or, like, DeKalb County. DeKalb County is seriously in, in, uh, 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 dense in, in that particular county. And if you recall... In 2020, when Biden won, it was the black communities that took him over the edge. Of course. It was Philadelphia that took him over the edge in Pennsylvania. That's how he got those electoral votes. It was Milwaukee that took him over the edge. That's how he got the Wisconsin vote. It was Atlanta that took him over the edge when he got the votes in Georgia. So it was it was all of these really dense communities of black and brown people. The problem is they had to stand in line, some of them, eight hours to vote. So what happens? What happens is people will say either I'm not waiting eight hours. I know I was struggling. Now, I believe in voting all, all day long, Kev. I believe in voting, y'all. And, and, and ever since I was 18 years old, I was voting. But I ain't gonna lie. I was struggle with so waiting I, eight hours it doesn't make sense. to vote. And they know that's going to deter people. They know that people are going to get out of line. They know people got to go to work. People got to go pick up their kids. People want to go eat. People have medical issues, so they can't stay in line that long. They know this. That makes no sense. But, again, that also perpetuates the fact that to keep certain people in power and to keep other people out, you, you have these mechanisms to deter people from voting. My question for you, though, is, is it that it doesn't make any sense? Or is it? Or is it? It makes a whole lot of sense if that's your goal. Well, if the goal is is to slow the voting process down, and you are doing your job. There you go. Right. There you go. The system is doing what it's supposed to. It's doing what it's supposed to do. Right. So that's number one. Voting rights is on the black agenda in NAACP. So scale of one to ten, how important is voting rights for you personally um, to be a part of the black agenda? Absolutely, number ten. Ten. How how important? Twenty five. Twenty five. Me, 10 as well. Okay. Number two, economic equity. Mm, Advancing economic opportunities and addressing systemic barriers to financial stability. Let's talk about it. It's funny. So, you know, I, I, I have multiple shows that I'm on, multiple platforms. Yeah, I feel some type of way about that, Todd. I know, because you talk. I, I just want you to know, Todd. Don't, don't be bringing that up on this show. I have to bring it up. Don't bring that up that you on multiple, you moonlighter. Don't, don't talk about so, that. I got to bring it up because it's, it, it's relevant because literally I was taping one of those platforms here you go. this morning. See, see, here you go. And on that platform, we were talking talking about the cost of living in 1970. Mm -hmm. And I said to uh, my my co-host, I said to him, I said, and you wonder why non-people of color are able to have their spouses stay at home as a norm versus us because back in the 1970s when things were so cheap and economically available to you, uh, like like the, the picket fence, the White House with a picket fence was so available to you back then, we didn't have those opportunities. We had the barriers. So we weren't able to take advantage of it. So we are centuries and generations behind other people. And so now that because of laws and because of lawsuits, and in bills that have been passed, we are now getting some access. I still didn't say all, but we're getting more access than probably ever before. It's out of our reach because it's now so expensive. It is. It is so expensive to buy a house. It is so expensive to buy a car. It is so expensive to be able to live the type of lifestyle that our grandparents could have lived had they had the same equal access as their white counterparts. And so we're we're centuries and generations behind. You're talking about buying houses. Well, get some bread and some milk <laughs> and some cheese. Dude, <laughs> that's for real. That's, that's real that talk. Is, that is for real. I mean, that's you, real you, talk. I go to the grocery store and I buy five things I, and I, might, I look at my bill. It's 80 dollars. bucks. Yep. I'll go you know, and I, I have All I bought is some M&Ms and a soda. I haven't got anything in the substance to take care of. Nope. And, and you hear that and you think about 
um, the generational wealth gap between mm -hmm. um, African Americans and our white counterparts. You see how, like you say, the wife can stay home and the husband do what they need to do, but like they they were exposed to stocks and bonds and understanding what the interest rate is Decades and all that kind ago. of stuff. Decades and ago. then like and you look at us like now, me personally. I make more money than I've ever made in my whole life, but I'm still mm -hmm. not where I, my wife mm -hmm. was talking about it on the way here. We're not where we want to be. Like, wanting to retire at 55, mm -hmm. that's not a real reality mm -hmm. for someone of color. But you look at our white counterparts mm -hmm. who have trust funds, mm -hmm. and they go to work because they want to and they right. enjoy. Right. We talked to an investor, and they were like, hey, we're not trying to be funny. You just don't have enough money to put into this portfolio. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, this is X number thousand dollars. You got people coming with twenty five and thirty thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and I'm looking like, where are they getting this money from? So, so let me ask you then. Mm -hmm. All right, yes. So it's historically, black people start behind the eight ball. They are behind when we are born into the world compared to whites, mm -hmm. right? We know now buying a home is almost nearly impossible for a lot yes. of people. But you can rent though you the can same rent. amount of money. But the okay, I'm glad you said that because rent. Can be just as expensive or as a mortgage. Yeah, yeah, or but if, more. yeah, but if you're looking at an apart, well, the real wealth in our country comes from home ownership, right? Because you get equity, you get the equity in the house that allows you to do other things, right? The value that you put into a property as it appreciates over time, you don't get that in rent. No, right? That's the challenge. You you give it to someone else. But yes, so my question here is, I don't believe either president can control the big. Fortune 500 companies. Like you take, for example, the oil companies. They decide how much gas is going to be. Now, I know the barrels of oil and all that kind of stuff. But, Ton, they have record profits, man. Do you, do you know why they have record profits? Because they can do what they want. Well, do you know why they can do what they want? Because there's one party that believes in the least amount of regulation of corporate corporate corporations. And so because there's no regulation, there are things that they can do and get away with. And I, I remember, okay, I get case in point. I remember years and years and years ago, I was working for Bank of America. Well, I was a young guy working for Bank of America. And I was considering going into corporate America or staying into corporate America. I was already in it. But I was considering staying into corporate America versus prosecuting again. And I'm going to tell you what made me decide not to do that. Bank of America was having a shortfall with their bottom line. And because they had this shortfall, them jokers got rid of hundreds of middle management, your VPs and your, uh, I, I won't say, well, well some, some senior VPs in there, but people who had worked there for 20 and 30 years and had given their youth and they're now they're making like serious bank. They got rid of all of those jokers or a whole bunch of those jokers. I should say, I shouldn't say all, but a whole lot of them, so that they can be able to meet their bottom line for their stock, their their um their stock meeting. And that's then the point. They turn around and hire the young people who are graduating from college and the young people who were coming up the ranks for a fraction. Of what they were paying those people who had given them their youth. And they came to me and they were like, you want to go into management? And I said, nah. And I went back into prosecution because I said, you will not have my youth. I will not give you my youth. And then 20 years from now, I look back and you get rid of me and you said, I'll give you six months uh, severance pay. And now I got to try to find a job that will pay me a fraction of what I was making uh, with your company. So, nah, I, I, but that when you take away the regulations, you can do stuff like that. But to your point, you own stock, I own stock, Jay, you own stock, mm -hmm. right? What we expect is a return on our investment. We do. Right? We expect to get a profit. We do. So then the company understands that. You got billions and millions of people that, that own these shares. They know that they are responsible to the public to show a profit, Right. You get a. You mean to tell me if you're an oil company, you, you you invest in an oil company, and you see that you can get ten percent back on your stock, you wouldn't want them to do it. Let me take. This is what this is what is happening, Todd. So so, so you're talking about ethics and there and, is and, no ethics, man. Well, here's the thing: there is no ethics for some companies, but there are plenty of companies out there Look. that have an ethical uh, mindset into how they they create wealth and make money. There's very little ethics in capitalism. 
Well, I, I will agree on that, but there are those that can do that, and 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 they do. And do they it. do do it, but yes. they're not the stocks that's making the most money for people. All right, Todd. Let's well, just be honest about it. Well, how are you making the money? You're making the money. Here's the biggest thing that happened in 2020 that affected me personally is when uh, number well, he was number 45. Number 45 gave that huge tax break to the one percent. And them jokers didn't have to pay uh, taxes like Amazon Correct. and all of those. They didn't have to pay all these taxes that we got to pay. And then he turned around and he cut a whole bunch of uh, tax breaks that middle class had. And so I had just purchased a house not too long after. And it wasn't 2020. It was actually 2016. But 2016 when he did it. I had just purchased a house in 2018. And when I purchased the house, we... Uh, uh, we did some re revamping of it. I put some serious money into that house. I could not write any of that off because he had changed the tax code for the working class and the middle class. Of course, because he's benefiting because he owns the businesses, right? He's a business owner, so he's in the top 1%. Most of them don't care about the middle class anyway, right? right? But my, my point is this. If you look at oil, oil controls your gas. Yeah. It controls your heat yep. in your house. It controls a lot of things. Like an airplane ticket is higher mm -hmm. because because gas is higher, and and the way they price stuff is uh, is is arbitrary, man. It's based on okay, this quarter we want to make a lot of profit, so they charge more. And what can we do about it? It's not like you can go somewhere else and get a cheaper version because you need gas. Well, my thing about all of that is this: with more regulation. There are less things that they're able to do. All right, take this for example, Todd. Jay, what about medication? <laughs> what, why is it that you have certain medications that are exorbitantly high when you know these people need these medications to stay alive? Diabetes medication, cancers, Cancer. all this. Why is the medication so high? One joker, I think, has gone to prison for that. He owned this uh, pharmaceutical company, and he purchased, uh, he, oh, he had this medicine, and it was a, uh, a cancer drug. And he allowed the cancer drug to go up to, like, 10 times what it should have yeah, caused okay. and people could not afford to get the drug and people were dying as a result of that and i think he actually ended up going to prison for uh sec uh fraud eventually man you got some people paying a thousand dollars a month that's crazy on on medicine that's crazy so you're telling me you know they they making decisions between do i eat more you're talking about going to the grocery store maybe i could eat more but i gotta pay this medicine to stay alive. Some people cut their diabetic medicine. This is this, so they're again, cutting it. If we are the most advanced country in the world, why are we putting people in situations like this? And the answer is capitalism. Oh, it's capitalism, man. no question, right? So to the point, economic equity for for blacks because we know that this is impacting our community. Damn, bro. And Jay, even you said it. Um, we are we're the most educated that we've ever been in this country. Mm -hmm. But the wealth gap is only widening mm -hmm. and getting worse. There's something wrong with that picture, man. But then you also got to think about how society and culture is painting the picture. Because, uh, like, my generation below don't want to go to work. And we saw that with COVID. Um, so many people are, have not returned to the working force. But they're going on trips. They're buying the latest J's. They got all Flip the other kind corn. of stuff. Flip that corn, Jay. <laughs> Tell well, it, tell it. I'm, Flip that coin, tell it. I, I don't want to do that to y'all. No, I you need to tell the truth. It's the barbershop, so let's talk about it. They lazy. Okay. They, they lazy. Okay. And, and they, they don't have the same work ethic as, you know, our forefathers had going out. And, you know, well, how they go on those trips then? Because everybody want to be a creative. <sighs> they they, uh, they want to be uh, or go get their only fan page, which I'm finding that a lot of young people are aspiring to this kind of foolishness. Because me, there are a lot of people who you became millionaires. Bank. Yeah. yeah you a lot of people bank. became but millionaires. So, so I'm going to sell my soul to make uh, millions? Is that what we're saying? Yeah, absolutely. Well, well they, mm, here's the reality. Okay. Tom, the right. reality is, is that porn has become low-key mainstream. Yeah. yeah. Right? So if porn is low-key become mainstream, then what's the issue with OnlyFans? Because it's already out there, porn is the most profitable business in our country, and it ain't even close. Yeah, but is it your body that you are allowing everyone to see? And that goes to the very crust of your soul. So again, are you going to sell your soul for a dollar? 
That's the question. Yeah, forget, you, you forget, say, for, forget the demand. I ain't talking about even not say <laughs> when I even when I when I was backslid, I still had some level of morality where I'm yeah. like I knew right from wrong. I mean, I mean, people know right from wrong. You know, showing your body or or selling your body to make well, money is I gotta wrong. Push, gotta push back on that. Um, so people will use scripture uh, to sell your body. No, to justify the end, the, the means. To, because they have to eat, they have to do certain things. Mm -hmm. So they'll say. So how you use a scripture to sell your body? Well, I don't know because I don't sell my body. Okay. <laughs> we're talking, we're talking. We are glad Todd. you hear that, Todd. Jay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't sell my. I don't no. know. But, but Todd, you're talking from a Christian perspective. Yeah. No, actually, I'm really, I'm not. I really. You're talking not. about, you know, just talking morals. About just, in, in, just in general. But you, you well, said it so. is in general. Just in general. You got a, you got a teacher. That's making $40,000, yeah. right? Can't make ends meet, got two kids, single, trying to make it, mm -hmm. and struggling. And now I can go on OnlyFans and sell my body and make three times that amount in, in a month. Yeah. Todd? Yeah. And, and it, you got to think about it. Sometimes these women, they're not, and men, they're not selling their body. You got people that I heard, I didn't see this, and I had a party. <laughs> yeah. Let's just be clear. Just the barbershop, boy. You, you know. better tell the truth. No, no. <laughs> tell yeah, the they, truth. They lie. Um, no, they sell them bath water and like dirty all, bath water. all types of fantasies. Like, it's, 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 the fetish is like yeah, it's you know taking pictures of feet. Yeah, so you don't that. have to have and sex. You ain't selling. And you ain't got to show your yeah. breasts and all your private parts. You can just say hey, and you don't have to give them your bath water. You can give them the water out of this cup right here. So you telling me I could take a photo of my foot and and sell that on a OnlyFans? Yeah. Page. Yes, you could. And people are buying that. Yes, you yeah. could. Oh, that's crazy. That's crazy. People, our society, we crazy. What's wrong with us, y'all? Because, because porn has become mainstream and because now sexual fantasies are more acceptable to talk about and to explore. And this is where we are. Right? Right, uh, wrong, and different. So economic. economic equity, what do you give it? A <laughs> scale it's, of one to it's ten. a ten. It's still a ten. So, still a ten. That's most important. Yeah. Would you take it over voting rights? Which one? No. I, I, whoa, whoa. Uh, no, no, no. Give, give, give me my money. Can, can I can I tell you this? Which which one are you taking first? I'm, I'm gonna take economic. Can I tell you why I'm gonna take economic? I'm gonna take economic is because the one thing that I have noticed and I navigate throughout uh, a variety of uh, socioeconomic um, um, communities, money is the number one thing that everybody respect. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you black, white, Asian, uh, Buddhist, whatever. Money, oh, they respect money. And I don't care who you are. They respect money, especially if you got way more than they do. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to agree. I'm going to put economic equity at the top of the list so far over voting rights with a caveat, if we know what to do with it. Think, that part. Yeah. Because I think a lot part. of us don't know what to do with it. That part. Right. And even if some people had money, they ain't using it right. Yeah, you, you, can win the lot, you can win the lottery and be broke in a year. Absolutely. But I tell you, you give me $800 million. I'm different and I'm not broke. But it's it's priorities. It's it's what you do with it, yeah. right? It's all that kind of stuff. Yeah. All right, Todd, this one is down your down your lane. It's probably gonna be the rest of the show. <laughs> oh Lord. Oh Lord. Number three on the black agenda for the NAACP. Voting rights was one, economic equity was two, criminal justice reform is number three. Okay. Ending mass incarceration and supporting the George Floyd. Justice and Policing Act. Question. Yes. How are they going to end mass incarceration? Well, that's what the goal is for this black agenda. And before we answer that question, let me also explain to the audience what the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act is. Okay. Because there are several parts to it. There are six things in this act that are being raised to, to address how policing happens in the black community. Okay. Number one, you tell me if you agree. Ton and Jay. Banning chokeholds and no-knock warrants. Yes. Mm, banning no-knock warrants? Mm -hmm. I can't say I agree with that. Okay. Okay. Ton, explain to the listener for people who don't know, what's a no-knock warrant? So, no-knock warrant is if you believe that there's exigent circumstances, like there is a dangerous situation. We got people that don't know what exigent I, means. I was about what, to what that mean? <laughs> wow. 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 We got an audience. Y'all see how he just... This is like saying for this up. We, you know, I'm looking at <laughs> you. What you this Sam is a, this Smitty and Hoppy. What, what you talking about, man? Oh, no. What is exigent, man? Somebody say exit. It's the barbershop. Don't nobody the barbershop say I got exigent circumstances. I mean, but I'm giving you, I'm giving you the legal term. Hey, we're halfway through the show. 
Big shout out to everyone tuning in. Thank you all so much. If you're loving the content, consider supporting us by becoming a sponsor. Just contact us via email at thecrewradioshow757 at gmail.com. Now stick around. We've got even more good stuff coming your way. So we in the barbershop, man. This ain't the courtroom. I'm, I'm, okay, I'm forgiving y'all. I'm forgiving. I can't even say the word. Exigent <laughs> circumstances are is an, I was about to break it down before he, he jumped on me. But anyway, exigent circumstances are when when there's an emergency, when there's an emergency that arises where someone life. Uh, or the life of another could potentially be in danger if you would go by the regular routine. Those circumstances will create a uh, factor in you being able to enter a house, um, enter a building, or, or some type of dwelling so that you can either uh, arrest someone without a warrant, um, or even if you are trying to detain someone or if you are investigating and you recognize that, that like, let's say somebody just did a shooting and somebody saw that shooter run into that building. Well, you can run into that building to, do, to go apprehend that person without a warrant. Okay. All and right. without announcing and without knocking. Well, so can, I, can I qualify why I have an issue with no knock warrant? Uh -huh. Or getting rid of them, because I have a lot of friends and families that I, I police. And what I hear, if I'm wrong, please educate me. When I hear people want to get rid of no-knock warrants, if you have a violent situation like what you just talked about, um, and then you know where the person is, and they may have a lot of guns and weaponry, you don't, to, to me, you don't want to go and knock on it and announce you to police. You give them an opportunity to mount up, and then they can return fire before anything happens. So for me, but you on the other side, you got to make sure that is the right address Well, for he, me. Well, here's the thing. With those type of bills or laws, typically there is an exception when you're dealing with a situation that you have just described. Now, if that's it, then I am against it. I, right. I'm for it, what we just said. Right. So that's what happened with the young lady in Louisville, right? That is correct. Um, when they went and they um, didn't knock, they just busted in and they shot her up and they were supposedly looking for the boyfriend who was supposedly involved in drugs and things of that nature. And so, and so he got arrested. So part of part of this comes from situations like that, right? Right. And we, but we all agree about banning chokeholds. Do we agree? Yes, with that? I okay, agree. So we're no need. All right. Ending racial and religious profiling. How do yes, you feel absolutely. about that? Okay. Use of force standards. Well, every police department in the country should have a use of force standard, and most of them, if not all, probably do. They just don't, unfortunately, abide by them. So absolutely. So in a use of force standard, to me, that's very subjective. If you find yourself in a situation where you feel like, I mean, you don't know. Mm -mm, it's not. There is an objective standard that, uh, uh, diff that cert like a certified standard that uh, some are nationwide standards, some are statewide standards, but it is an objective standard that they utilize. So that's why when a person is charged, or a, a police officer is charged for violating the use of force, they bring in experts who will look at what they have done and they will say, based upon their actions, they have violated what we would consider an objective, reasonable standard of force. So there are objective standards. So not too long ago, football player Tyreek Hill, you know, he, he got arrested by detained. the police, detained, detained for a traffic stop. Going to the game. Yeah. Right. Traffic stop. And, and, they, and he alleges that, you know, they put a knee in his back. They did all of this stuff. He was cooperating. Mm -hmm. The police came back and said, you know what? No, he was uncooperative. Mm -hmm. He goes on and says, you know, what would have happened if I want Tyreek Hill as a black man? What could have happened in this situation? If I was Tom Brady. And none of them had body cameras. And none of them had body cameras. But there was a video that has now surfaced. Correct. And it shows a police officer kicking him while he's on the ground. So... You you say that this use of force standards would you would support this? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Do you see any scenario where an officer might say, "Well, if I feel like my life is threatened and I'm doing what's necessary to protect myself"? Well, here's the thing. What we're gonna do? You have to take every individual situation uh, absent. I mean, you got to isolate each and every situation and base it upon the standard. So it's like 
It's like negligence. Negligence uh, is when there's a duty of care and someone has breached or violated that duty of care and there has been some type of damage that has come as a result of that breach. So with standard of force or use of force, there is a use of force standard. That's the standard. If you violate that standard based on your actions, then that's a breach. Based upon that breach, you can be held accountable by way of criminal criminal litigation. So what's going to happen is you're going to have experts that's going to look at your behavior, and then they're going to take that behavior and they're going to put it next to the use of force standard that was with that your police department has. And if they feel like you violated that use of force, they're going to say it was a violation and they're going to testify as such. Okay. All right. So, again, we're talking about the George Floyd Policing Act, right? These are six things that are in this act that the NAACP says should be passed. Yes, I have okay. no problem with any of them okay. right now. So, so far, banning chokeholds and no-knock warrants, we agree. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ending racial and religious profiling, mm-hmm. we agree. Mm-hmm. Use of four standards. Mm-hmm. Number four is accountability and transparency. I agree. Mm-hmm. What do you agree with? I agree with all of that because I think that we should know what goes on concerning police officers particularly when they have a prior history of misconduct. We should be uh, privy to their their record. For instance, the officer who had gone to, I think it was like six different sheriff's offices, and then he eventually shot the lady in the face. Recently, uh, Sandra, uh, I can't remember her last name, but shot her in her face, and the only thing she was doing was she was praying at the time. Right. She, she literally was praying, like, you know, I rebuke you, Satan. I think she said something like that. But she had a pot of water because she was at the stove. And he tried to make it seem as if she was going to throw the water on him or maybe throw the pot at him. But that's not what she was doing. The video clearly showed all she was doing was praying. Well, he shot her in the face. And so he had been fired and forced to resign from a number of prior sheriff's departments and prior police departments. And the sheriff that hired him knew his record. That's why he had to retire, because the public pressure was on him to make him retire, because they said, you should have never hired him. So when you say we should know, you're now saying... The public. You're now saying that the public should be aware of all public employees... Work history? No. What I am saying, because this is not dealing with all public employees, this is specifically dealing with law enforcement. So there is an issue of misconduct. I think that the public should be aware of that. It should be uh, foyable. Somebody should be able to seek that out. And if what not you, what them, did you say? if mm-hmm. not them, full, foyable, foyable. So you ever uh, say that a Freedom of uh-uh. Information Act. Full. Freedom of Information Act. <laughs> foyable. <laughs> Foyer. Foyer bull. I'm trying to get my hair cut. He talking about foyer bull. You know what? Whatever. He act like he's not educated with his doctorate degree. Okay, y'all? That's what I'm trying to get Come some on, understanding Keep about. Going. Like nobody don't, don't ever get Keep foyer. going. No, no, no. Because you're coming from me. No, I'm not and coming so, from you. <laughs> Here we go. Here we I'm go. just saying. I'm going to leave it alone. Okay. I'm going to digress. But a for, if not a foyer bull, uh, 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 um, misconduct, I think at least the prosecutor, like in Virginia, the prosecutor can ask for a person's uh, records. Uh, so I can look at anybody's personnel record and say, okay, him and that, hand that record to me. And I don't have to tell you why I want it. I can just ask for it. Okay, fair enough. So you agree accountability and transparency? Correct. Jay? I agree. Okay. Data collecting and reporting. Now, what are you collecting? The act mandates data collection on police encounters and requires the use of body cameras and dashboard cameras by federal officers. So maybe the question that we need to raise is why aren't body cameras always on? Why should it be that the officer has the ability to turn it on and off? Because there are sometimes um, like little issues that may arise when the person may go to turn it on and it doesn't turn on. So they thinking that they're turning it on and it doesn't. So you have equipment failure. You have equipment failure with anything. So, But in many cam- cases, they are making the decision 
not to turn the body cam on. Now, if they are making a decision to turn the body cam on and their policy mandates that any encounter that they have with the public, they should have that body cam on, they're already in violation of policy. So there should already be some type of reprimand, if not uh, more severe than that. So that's first thing. Four officers arrested Tyreek Hill. For, None of them had a body camera on, man. And it was on purpose. But only one of them got administrative leave. Yeah. So so why why aren't the other three then because the one, reprimanded for their behavior? Because the one that probably had the administrative leave was probably the one that some, – because someone leaked clearly the video of it. Several people had video shots or clips And this is of the fear happened. that people have. You turn the body camera off. Now it's my word against the officers – and most people are going to side with the officers, right? right? And, um, and, and unless you got proof, video proof, to show otherwise, that's that's the same thing that happened with the black cops. Where was it? It, it, it was in, in Memphis. Memphis. It was it's in the Memphis. same situation. They've been doing it for years, right? They, they collectively years. say this is the story. But unless that camera was up on that, that light post to really see what was happening, mm -hmm. that story would have been told differently it by the officers. It was told differently. So then, So then why aren't body cameras more... Like they just automatically, I guess, turn because on because you can't mandate a locality to have body cams, first of all, because the state normally doesn't pay for the body cams, that locality pays for that body cam. Like Hampton, we have body cams, Hampton pays for those body cams. The Commonwealth of Virginia does not pay for those body cams, so the Commonwealth of Virginia can't say, Well, we mandate that you all have body cams because if you're not giving us money to pay for them, who's gonna pay for it? Second, you can't say, Well, you have if you have body cams, it has to be on at all times because there may be situations where it can't be on. There may be situations where it may be a faulty situation. So there's just a variety of things that goes into that. So that is going to be sticky. Uh, that's probably why they said federal because federally you can control our federal officers if there's federal legislation concerning that. But statewide, you're going to have a problem with that. Jay, how you feel about body cams? Man? I need to be on. Because that's a level of accountability because uh, right, wrong, and indifferent, whatever that cop says, I mean, I went to court for speeding violations. And the judge, they always ask the cop, was he or she cooperative? cooperative? You know, I can't say because he got a foyer bubble and I can't, my words got messed up. Cooperative. Yep. And, and if that, even if I was, if that cop said I wasn't, um, the, the judge is going to believe what that exactly person says. Right. So, you know, and my dad always says get home, but I do believe that having the video cam on, on it just another level. If you if you ain't doing nothing wrong, I, mean, I, don't, I don't disagree with it. I mean, yeah. I, I absolutely don't disagree. I think the body cam, to be quite honest with you, protects the citizen as well as the officer because citizens lie too. Mm -hmm. They do. So I think the body cam protects both. Okay. So I, I like body cam. So you agree with data collection and reporting? Yes. All right. Military equipment. Now, here's the problem. <laughs> it limits the transfer of military-grade equipment to state and local law enforcement agencies. I don't agree with that. Why? Because if you remember in Uvalde, Texas, where that person went in there and shot everybody up, and everybody uh, that was in law enforcement stayed on the outside for what, what was it, an hour? Mm -hmm. Because they said the, the type of armory that this person had was so... Uh, high grade that it was uh, body armor piercing and so they didn't have any weaponry as far as their communication they felt like they didn't have the weaponry to be able to fire back and be able to be successful against this particular perpetrator and that's where I have a problem because if my kids in that school I don't care how you get up in that school if you got to have a bulldozer and you got to tear everything up in, the, in this pathway, including the perpetrator, run that joker over. I do not care. You shouldn't have been up in there with a the gun in my kid's school. So I do not care. But I, I'm like Malcolm. Any means necessary. Go get my kid. So you're saying you support the police having whatever, whatever they need, need to get the job done. Okay. Because the job is not going to always be pretty. And unless you are going to ban 
these AR-15s and all these other high-power rifles and weaponry that can pierce body armor. Unless you are going to have the, uh, I was going to use a word, but I'm going to say the the guts. There you go. <laughs> fortitude. <laughs> He's going to say fortitude. <laughs> I know that's where you're going. The intestinal fortitude. <laughs> that, that, I know that word. Come on. And unless you're going to have the guts <laughs> and go up against the NRA and, and, and say, we're going to ban all this stuff that we know is not used for hunting is only used for hunting human beings. So unless you're going to ban this stuff, then I want the police to be able to reciprocate or to be able to at least defend against what's already out there because the cro the crooks ain't going to play right. They're not going to play nice, and they're not going to play by the rules. So okay. give them what they need. So last month, 14-year-old kid goes into the school. Crazy. AR-14. 15, excuse 15. me. AR-15. That his dad brought for him, by the way. For Christmas. For Christmas. After the FBI and the... I'm mad about this. Can I just say that? I can tell. The FBI and the <laughs> sheriff the knocked on his door and told them that your son has been making threats to shoot up a school on a gaming system. And his present for him, months later for Christmas, is an AR-15. So... Teachers are dead. Students are dead. Right? <sighs> How do you feel about military? Would you be? Would you as? Because you're in the schools. Would mm -hmm. you feel safer if the security officer had the type of weaponry that could at least counter an AR-15 situation? Yeah, I need the the security guard to have it. I need the uh, SRO, the student resource officer. That that's um, but with half the city schools, I need her to have it. I need because like Anton said. If my kid is in that school, or if I'm in that school, I want you to come get me out. Come get right. me. <laughs> Please come get me. Come get me. We, we can't have nothing. You know, so we, we sitting ducks waiting for somebody to pick us off. So, nah, man, go ahead and give him that um, bazooka, AR-15, AR-19. Whatever. If you even if create, go ahead and create it and give it to us. <laughs> Whatever. Listen, it, it's, it's a very scary feeling to go to work. And know that you may not come home. And we're talking about we working in the school system. Or we're talking about we're going to church. We're not talking about going to the club or going to hang out, you know, on a dope corner. I'm going to school to and I'm going to church. And, Jay, and they were saying how already the teachers in the school are doing drills like a week into school for these kids to be aware of what they need to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in, the, in at, at risk of this same thing happening in their school, even to the point where there's a teacher who says they have um, a child, a special needs child, that under stressful situation, it's hard for them to be quiet. They get loud. And so the whole thing about these drills is trying to hide and try to, you know, fort, uh, uh, build a fort, basically, mm -hmm. within your classroom so they can't get in. Well, guess what? If you have this kid in there making this noise, what do you do? You put all the other kids at risk? Or do you put this kid out here and let that kid be a, a, a sacrificial lamb? And so you have teachers crying because they're like, God forbid if this ever happened in my school, what's going to happen to my kids? Because I got to protect this child just like I got to protect the other child. And it seems like the, the, the two goals are contradicting each other. They are. And to date, we've already had over 60 school shootings in our country. All ready this school season. Yeah. And school started in August. And school uh, late August. Well, some places it started early yeah, August, but it, you still talking about thirty August. days? Yeah, you talking about thirty days within yeah. the first thirty days? So, so let me let me, and that's across the country, mm -hmm. right? So let me let me just help you understand. So we're talking about the black agenda, right? That's the whole topic of this yes. conversation. What should we be looking at, thinking about when we go to the polls, right? Voting rights, we've agreed, ten yes. out of ten. Economic equity, ten out of ten. Criminal yes. justice reform. This is the conversation we're having. The George Floyd Justice Act is six areas. Banning chokeholds, ending racial and religious profiling, use of force standards, accountability and transparency, data collecting and reporting. Military equipment is the one we do not agree with. Correct. All right? All the other ones we do. Right. All right. So, But you also talked about before you got to the George Floyd Act. Now I'm going to answer your question. Okay. Because for the rest of the time, because oh, I know you, because right. I want to say the best for last, and I know you ready to just. I'm ready to pounce. I know you ready to go off on this. In the last I'm ready. 10 minutes we have. Yes. <laughs> no, hold on. We only have two minutes left. No, no, no. no. Okay, all right so, now. 
ending mass incarceration mm. is part of this criminal justice reform. Okay. And you have an issue with that one. My question is how? Talk to us. I, I, I want to know how. Because when you say ending mass incarceration, what are you talking about? Are you talking about those individuals who have committed heinous crimes? We need to release them earlier than what we were going to initially release them? I think when normally there's a conversation about mass incarceration, you know this time, it usually is not on the individual that commits the crime. It first talks about the systems okay. and the structures okay. that disproportionately impact our black community and put people in prison. Well, here's my question for you. When you're talking about the system and the structure that disproportionately put black people in prison, my question to you is, well, are there certain cities and urban areas where we have our black community killing at a greater proportion than our non-black. Because I could speak for Hampton, and I could speak for Newport News, and probably a lot of other cities, and South Hampton Roads. And unfortunately, when we talk about homicides, 78 to 85% of homicides committed in Hampton over the last 10 plus years have been black person killing another black person. So if you're talking about mass incarceration and the disproportionate number of black individuals going to prison, well, you got to address first the disproportionate number of black individuals killing other people. We got to address that because I don't care what system you have in place. If your individual who's committing the crime happens to be a black person, what are you going to do? Slap them on the wrist because they're black and say, well, it's because you're black, I'm sorry, there's too many of us in jail, so you don't go to jail. You go back home and go kill somebody else, and you know you still get out. No, let me play the other many. side. Let well, me, play the other side for this, me, because I need to understand. Because some people would say the system is what puts impoverished black people in a contained community with limited resources, limited access to better paying jobs, limited access to health care and, and better funding, which then you add the criminal justice element, which is taking black men out of homes. And now you got this chaotic environment that has been created by systems, which is also causing the crime and the shootings that you're seeing play out. How do you respond to that? I'm going to say, have y'all ever heard of a trailer park? Who lives in trailer parks? Come on, we come on. Let's let's we in the barber shop, so let's just keep it real. Cause y'all quiet on me right no, now. Like no, no, we wait for you to finish. Uh, Cause in the in the tra in the trailer park, it ain't us most times. Sometimes we're in there, but for the most part, in the trailer park, which is concentrated poverty that's living in trailers that is the same conditions if not worse conditions that you would see in the projects because i'm gonna tell you i live in a uh low income uh neighborhood that they call the whole one way in one way out. i saw shootings i saw drug dealings i saw all that stuff and i'm gonna tell you the apartment was nice but the conditions outside was bad my apartment was way better than a trailer park so then let me ask you that since you bring that up if if you're making the analogy between trailer park white community poverty are not shooting each other and killing each other nowhere near at the rate nowhere near of black people who are living in an impoverished community. nowhere near so then my question to you is what's <laughs> what do you believe is the difference in why poor white people don't shoot and kill each other versus impoverished black people a big issue, I think, is there's a lot of rage in our community okay. that we have not addressed. There's a lot of trauma in our community that we have not addressed. So when you are enraged, when you have past traumas that is unaddressed, you will see life through the eyes of that trauma, and you will see life through the eyes of that rage. So you think white people have trauma? I think poor? they do, but I think they deal with it differently. I think we deal with trauma uh, in a multi-layer situation. Like, for instance, I was talking to my, my one of my best friends who is going to Harvard, and he's uh, getting his his master's in psychology, and right now they're they're discussing grief, and he was talking about how with the black community we grieve on a multi layer dimension because for us family is not just my blood relative like you and I we call we we call each other brothers right if something happened to one of y'all I'm grieving 
Something happened to me. You better agree. You better cry hard too. And so, <laughs> come to my come to my funeral, my homecoming. And I told my wife, I said, I want you to shout too. I want you to dance for me because I'm going on to another place. But anyway, I digress. But we grieve on a different level because we have we create village relationships. So when we deal with stuff, we're dealing with it in, in, in greater levels than they're dealing with it. Because we have created that village. And so when you're talking about anger, when you talk about rage, when your friend has been killed and you don't know how to process that, and your mom tell you, well, you don't go, you're just going back to school the next day. But your friend just got killed. Or your sibling just got murdered. And you're and I'm talking, I'm talking, I'm giving you real examples, by the way. I'm giving you real examples. And the mom is told, we need to put your, your son in counseling. We need, we'll pay for it. We'll get him therapy because he has to process this rage. If not, it's gonna it's gonna come out some kind of way and it's not gonna be good. And the parent says, Oh, he'll be all right. Yeah, I got you now. And we, we're almost out of time. But, 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 let me, but let me say, but you don't think there's dysfunction in white impoverished communities. No, no but you, you look at it. There's trauma there too. That that, but they don't result in I, shooting and killing it's, each other. It's kind of what Tom said. I look at it from another aspect. Look at it from a musical standpoint. When a white person sings "Amazing Grace," it's it's pretty, it's cute, because they have a different conviction. But when someone of color sings "Amazing Grace," there's a different conviction, a different struggle that goes along with that. So when you have a concentrated group of African Americans in one area, that rage, that frustration is way different than the trailer park rage and, and frustration. It's how they look at it. It's that, that outset and that mental um, uh, outlook on that as well. He's talking about the trauma. Like black people handle trauma a lot differently totally than, different. than white people. Um, again, that familial type thing. Like you my brother, but when I, if I go to work and say, hey, my, my brother died, I'm like, is that your blood brother? Like, no. Nah. Mm-hmm. They're like, no, nah, it's not. You can't, have, you can't yeah. have all for that. Right, that's not right. your brother. All right, so we're almost out of time. So I'm going to give you the three can, that we can, talked can, about. Well, today. can we just do a part two? Yeah, we do part two. Yeah, let's just do a part let's two because we, 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 we can't rush this. Okay. We all can't right, rush this because I still got more to talk about this. Okay. I ain't finished. <laughs> can I end the show now? <laughs> well, go on and end the show. <laughs> go on end the show. So there were three that we covered today. Yes. All right. Voting rights, you said 10 out of 10. Yes. Mm-hmm. You agree, Jay? Mm-hmm. Economic equity. 10 out of 10. 10 mm-hmm. out of 10? Mm-hmm. Yes. In terms of importance yes. for the black agenda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Criminal justice reform. What's your number? Uh, how many uh, was with that, that bill, the, the George Floyd bill? It was six of those. Okay. Uh, five out of six. Five out of, but what's your 10 out of, on a scale oh. for criminal justice reform? Is it a 10 out of 10 as well? No, no, absolutely not. I say 7 out of 10. 7 I, out of 10. I, I would give it a 7. Uh, yeah, I'll give it a 7. Okay, so we're almost out. So if I'm hearing y'all correctly, if we were to rank the three in terms of highest priority. Economic. Economics. Mm-hmm. Voting. Voting. Criminal justice. Criminal mm-hmm. justice. That would be the order. And, and, but criminal justice is going to be a little bit further down. Okay. Not just right behind on, on his on his uh, edges. Heels, yeah. okay. On his heels. We got four more. That will be part two. Okay. In, in the black agenda. All so right. We're out of time today. Thank you for hanging with us in the barbershop. We learned some new words today. Yes. Foyable. For, for the itch. And, 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 um, well, what else we learned today? Exit. 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 That's the first time I've ever learned new words in the barbershop. That's why we Want y'all to stick with us. We wow. learn new words. We learn new words in the box. We <laughs> they, they act like y'all. They don't have education. That's what the thing that's this. Uh, just we out of time. This is exigent circumstances. We got yeah. this right. Love Until it. next time, be blessed to be a blessing to someone else. Peace. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of the Crew Radio Show. If you liked what you heard, be sure to subscribe and leave a review. We're always looking for great sponsors to support the show. If your company would like to reach our highly engaged audience, please drop us a line at thecrewradioshow757 at gmail.com. Until next time, thank you for kicking it with the crew.